Uh, this is a long one, I'm afraid, so buckle up. But it's called What If So Val Isn't the True Jailer? Now, I haven't read it because, like I say, it's a fucking long one. And I thought there's two ways I can read this article. I can either, like, run myself a bath, light some fucking candles, put on some nice music, and have a little read in my own time, or I can do it on screen with you. And that's what I'm going to do. So Discordian Kitty is a big friend of the channel. We like her very much on this channel. She's very cool. She's an excellent writer for Wowhead, in my opinion. She takes zero shit online, which I always respect, because because some motherfuckers try and give her some shit online because she's a woman, she's got like cool hair and that's basically what it takes a lot of the time. And she seems to have like good opinions on things. I would go as far, in, in as much as you can say this about someone that you interact with online, I'd go as far as to call her a friend. Uh, I hope this is good. <laughs> Yeah, I highly recommend you go and follow her on Twitter if you don't already. She's a, she's a, a really, really fucking good follow. Anyway, what if Zoval isn't the jailer, but instead dominated a pawn? When it comes to law analysis, sometimes it's fun to speculate, even when you know the theory is likely too far-fetched to be true. Just for fun, as the story of the Shadowlands winds down, I want to present my own wildest theory. The Primus is the jailer. Zoval is, and has been from nearly the start, his dominated pawn speaking his words and carrying out his plans. And we've just made a very, very big mistake. Let me explain. Fucking excellent intro, Discordian Kitty. Yeah, I'm convinced. <laughs> If you're not convinced now, maybe you'll be convinced after the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16 chapters that this is written in. My theory begins with the Shadowlands announcements trailer, not the one where we see Sylvanas tear apart the Helm of Domination, the announcement trailer that we all saw at BlizzCon 2019 opening ceremony. Sylvanas, arriving in the Shadowlands, walks up to a figure, kneeling and chained, we catch our first glimpse of the Jailer. There he is. I mean, he does look more like the Primus than he does the Jailer, doesn't he, right? And here is where it gets interesting. That silhouette of the Jailer does not look anything like the Jailer as we know him. Back in 2019, YouTube Pyromancer leaked an image allegedly of the early concept art of the Jailer. This image matches the silhouette that we saw in the trailer. Both images look nothing like Zoval, but they do look a great deal like someone else we know. The Primus. Yes. I mean, if you showed me this photo and this photo, I wouldn't really say they look alike, but what I, I would concede that he looks a lot more like this than the current Jailer model does for sure. We have been given an official reason for this. Any minor differences we see is what happens when early concept art is released before final creative decisions have been made. Ian Hazacostis said as much in an interview. But indulge me for a moment. What if we let ourselves believe, for the purposes of this article, that the reason why the Jailer looks like the Primus in this very first preview of the expansion is because it's a clue to the twist that's been hiding in plain sight all a lot. In the Sepulchre of the First Ones raid, after we defeat Zoval, a cinematic plays showing us his death. These are the things that stood out and made me start to question, well, everything. First, when Zoval is defeated and his armor melts away from him, the visual effect is very similar to the way the Domination armor fell away from Anduin. This is definitely true. Second, when we see a flashback of Zoval being judged by his other Eternals, we never see the Primus. Instead, he casts his shadow over Zoval on ominously, and we hear the clinking of Zoval's chains. While this could have simply been done to save on the trouble of having to create a high-res model of the Primus, it's possible, <laughs> the effect can't help but be sinister, and it almost seems to highlight the fact that the Primus was the one who imprisoned Zoval, and could be said to be his jailer. Finally, when the Primus asks Zoval to explain himself, we see a side of Zoval that we just haven't seen before. And his reasoning here is suddenly very different to anything we've heard him from him before. Disconcertingly so. You preserve that which is doomed. A cosmos divided will not survive what is to come. In fact, the sudden apparent change in messaging has received quite a bit of a bash backlash from players, frustrated that Zoval would wait until he's literally dying before mentioning his whole plan is part of a greater good. There's 
There's also the question of why Zaval's apparent fear of a bigger threat has never once been mentioned to us. Sylvanas doesn't seem to know about it because she doesn't use it at all in her arguments with Anduin Rin. When the other Eternal Ones tell us about this scene, they talk about stripping Zoval of the Arbiter's power and sentencing him to the Moor, but not about him apparently fearing a greater threat to come. It seems like a strangely important thing to gloss over. Now, I'll give my opinion on all this as we as we go, but I'm just I'm just I'm letting this theory wash over me for the time being, and we'll we'll come to it when we you know we'll discuss it properly. So here is the theory. Long ago, Zoval, the Primus, and Sire Demathrius came into two pieces of important information. One was that a great threat is looming. The other is that the sigils of the Eternal Ones can be used to unlock a portal into the Forbidden Realm of Zerath Mortis, which contains the power to reshape the universe itself. The three agreed to do something about it. They would gain access to Zerath Mortis and use the power to save the universe! The Primus, warmongering to his core, felt that the only way forward is for the powers of death to gain complete and total control over the universe, to defeat all the other cosmos and reign supreme. Denathrius agreed. Zavau, however, believed otherwise. In his own words, a cosmos divided will not survive what is to come. A fight broke out, and rather than help the Primus, Zavau had become an obstacle in his way. The Primus revealed the evidence that they had that Zoval had been trying to reach Zerath Mortis, accusing him of trying to access forbidden knowledge to increase his own power. A master manipulator, the Primus arranged things so that it seemed Zoval was guilty of the crimes that would upset the other Eternal Ones the most. This can be seen in the judgment itself. Criesta, the Archon, seems shocked that Zoval, the Arbiter, would forsake his sacred duty. The Winter Queen is terrified that Zoval threatened the Great Cycle. Denathrius, of course knows the truth, and only reminds Zoval that he could have chosen to work with him and the Primus rather than go along with their plans. Zoval was blindsided and did not see the, the threat coming. Before he had much of a chance to do anything, he found himself stripped of the Arbiter's power and in chains. The crime he was accused of, apparently so terrible, the rest of the Eternal Ones condoned the most severe punishment possible. As we know, the Primus and not the Jailer created domination magic and used it to bind Zoval as part of his sentence to the Moor. All the domination that we have seen in our own realm, the Lich King's helmet, Frostmourn, is the result of the Primus. According to him, Zoval turned domination around on him, forcing him to make these creations, which he then sent out to other realms. But more on that later. Much later. The first time we see a dominated Anduin, it's in the cinematic Kingsmourn. The Jailer, out of patience, finally commands Sylvanas to forcefully dominate Anduin against his will. I'm not sure if it's out of patience. Uh, this is a, only a very small thing and doesn't affect the article or what the article is saying at all, by the way. But um, I don't think the, the Jailer is ever portrayed as being out of patience. The Jailer is just doing what the Jailer does. Jailer is just like, oh, we've got Anduin now. There's no way he's going to like work for us willingly. So I'm just going to make a Mourn Blade and dominate him. And Sylvanas is like, yo, let me try and turn him. Let me do it. I reckon I'll be able to convince him. And the jailer's like, uh, I see no harm in that. You've got until literally I make this Mourn Blade. So the jailer doesn't hold off making the Mourn Blade. He's like, I'm making the Mourn Blade. And as soon as it's finished, we're going to dominate Anduin Rin. So you've got until then. <laughs> I don't think he runs out of patience. I think he just, like, does the plan. <laughs> but that is not important to the point being made. I'm being a bit of a fedora wanker, and I apologize. In Talia Nef Evertel's cinematic analysis of Kingsborn, she links to our video in this article. Well, well, well. Here we are, just reading a little Wowhead article. When you're reading a Wowhead article and they link to your video, Taliesin points out the fact that, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's bound to be fucking dynamite, right? I don't know what I'm about to say, but you know you can trust it. I don't know what amazing point I'm about to make, but it's definitely gonna knock your dick off. Taliesin points out the fact that for a moment, we don't know for sure if Anduin has been corrupted or not. Fuck, what an amazing point. Oh my God, what an amazing point. The insight. The sheer big-brained awesomeness of that take. One in and everyone in chat. There were no dicks in chat that day because all the dicks fell off. Because of the insight. And you know what they say. So Steve, yeah. Are you saying that Taliesin was right all along? That's what I heard too. <laughs> 
Meliodas was right. Are you saying that's canon? I'll admit I wasn't sold on this this theory straight away, but shit, your sources are impeccable. As if this wasn't going to take long enough anyway. The scene changes, and we see Anduin arriving in Elysian Hold. He looks like himself, sounds like himself, and even uses his own voice at first. The only real visual hint that we have that something's amiss is his expression. Anduin, the great lover of, lover of peace, doesn't usually look this aggressive. I know, he's scary, and I like it. It's only after the Archon realizes it's the Jailer that the illusion fades away, and we see the visual signs of domination too late, as it turns out, to save the Archon from attack or stop the jailer from getting her sigil. This theme that appearances can be misleading is a common one throughout Shadowlands. However, even when Anduin still looks like himself, and certainly after he starts to show the more obvious visual effects of domination, we understand that when he speaks, it is usually not his voice. Rather, the jailer speaks through him and continues to do so even during and after the Anduin Rin boss fight. Back to Zoval, when he became the very first being to be dominated, the Primus carved the domination runes directly into his flesh. And here's something to, to consider. Every other dominated character that we have seen has not acted like themselves, has not spoken with their own voice. The sole purpose of domination is utter control, to fully dominate a person's will. Why exactly do we just accept the premise that he is entirely in charge of his own will? Going back over the uh, Jailer uh, defeat cinematic, I noticed something potentially significant. While Zoval is replying to the Primus's question, there are no runes yet carved into his face. He has not been dominated. What's more, the scene changes halfway through his sentence as he says, you preserve that which is doomed. A cosmos divided will not survive. The scene of his, of his memory kneeling in front of the Primus, but then it changes to present time and we see the jailer now transformed into an empty vessel muttering his final words, what is to come? Here's what I think happened says Discordian Kitty. The reason why the memory cuts off in that moment is because that is the last memory Zoval had before his mind was forever bound by domination. I believe that was the moment the Primus carved his runes into, into Zoval's flesh, cutting him off mid-sentence. <laughs> the Eternal Ones never heard those final words. I also believe Zoval has been dominated from that moment until just before his death. Again, we watched the domination apparently fall away from him in the same way it melted away from Anduin. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This is awesome, by the way. I really like this theory. I'm a big fan of this theory. This is excellent speculation done well, but I do also fucking love the idea that Zoval was mid-sentence when he was dominated. And the first thing that happens when the domination is lifted, millennia, thousands, probably millions of years later, is that he finishes his sentence. I love it. I'm not criticizing it. I love it. I think it's fantastic. The whole like, Tally, what do you want for tea? Oh, I really fancy... <laughs> dominated. Millions of years later, I will destroy you all. Death comes for the soul of your world. I will really make reality. Ugh. Destruction. Boom, boom. Run away, little girl. Run away. Boom, boom, boom. Ah, they got me. They got me. Cheese on toast. <laughs> Fucking love it. <laughs> I believe the main reason why Zoval seems so different in that scene is because that is the only time we have ever witnessed Zoval speaking with his own voice. Every interaction we've had with him since his domination has really been with the Jailer, a being that has all along not been Zoval, but Zoval's Jailer, the person dominating Zoval and controlling him, the Primus. If, in this cinematic, this is really what we're seeing, the end of Zoval's domination, then it casts the flashbacks he sees here in a different light as well. The sky above Ice Crown, torn open. Zoval in full domination armor. Zoval before his full armor, but the runes of domination carved into his flesh glow with power, and he wears a collar around his neck. Oh, he does. She's convincing me. She's right. 
like they make a really big deal when Anduin loses his domination of his collar falling off, right? Like they make a big deal of pointing out when Anduin is is dominated and when he's when he uh, is freed from domination, they make a really big deal of the fact that the collar is one of the main things in that. And the jailer does wear a big fucking collar. And she's right, you know, the the flashback bit, which I have to hand because I am a creator. I always thought this as well, actually. I think this this flashback is quite weird. This must not be. You. I always thought that that little uh, that little flashback was a bit odd. I mean, I, I I just took it as them showing us that we're going back in time, like uh, just a a convention to show us that we are traveling back in time. But you're right; it could be interpreted as portraying him in a slightly different way. This must not be you. Of course, the major flaw with this interpretation is obvious. Zoval may have started out dominated by the Primus, but he found a way to reverse domination's effects. What's more, when the Primus visited the Moor to investigate, Zoval turned his own magic on him, trapping him as the rune carver in Torghast and using domination to force him to create the artifacts we know are well known to us, such as the Helm of Domination and Frostmourne. Unless that isn't the truth. Uh, yeah, so uh, she's right. She's 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 doing a good steel man job on this. She is correct when she says that because these questions that we are raising here, it's worth noting that the game does answer them. It's worth noting that the game does answer these questions. Like the whole story of the beginning of Shadowlands is that yes, th one of the things that the jailer has managed to do is to gain freedom from the domination and uses it against the Primus much is made of this particularly in 9.1 as well but the runes are still glowing on the primus hmm interesting I, I i don't know if i agree with this theory but i really like it all of the jailers boasting about his own great and masterful plan zaval himself is not actually the shadowlands law character presented as being master strategist and tactician that is in fact something specifically said about the primus Primus of Maldraxxus was known to be the most tactical and strategic of the Eternal Ones. It's true. It's true. In an interview with SA Gamer, Steve Denuzzo explained just how the Primus became such a master strategist. It is said that the Primus sought out an ally who could show him the infinite timeways, which he used to watch the same battle play out over and over again across realities. He noted how the slightest differences in strategy and troop deployment could swing the conflict towards one side or the other. After eons of such meticulous study, the Primus can instantly assess any situation and devise the most likely path to victory. This is fucking brilliant. Why is this not in the game? <laughs> I've always said that, you know, there's no reason for the uh, the Jailer to be a shit villain, right? I am, uh, you know, he's clearly got an interesting backstory. Clearly, it's there. We just haven't been told it. And, you know, the, the hints at it are there, you know, like, you know, maybe it's this twist, but maybe it's, it's interesting enough anyway. And they just haven't fucking told us any of it. But I'm convinced that Blizzard know what it is. And this awesome bit of lore for the fucking Primus, which you'd only know if you'd read an interview in a South African magazine. Uh, Discording Kitty is, of course, South African, so she's got that over us. It is said that the Primus sought an ally who show him the infinite timeways is one hell of a line to suddenly just come across in a lore interview from over a year ago, what with all the talk about dragons in 10.0 and all. Not a bad point. Now, if I'm wrong, and so Val isn't the jailer, then this is weird. Why specifically set up the Primus as a master strategist like this? Unfortunately, like, un unfortunately, like, these are all very interesting questions. They are, and I'm totally 1000% into this theory. I love it. It's everything that a theory should be, putting it across as one should put across a theory, a little bit tongue in cheek, but also fucking certain of it, but also, hey, it's probably not true, but also, hmm, perfect. She's an excellent writer. She's a very, very good writer, Discordian Kitty. We've said this on the stream before. And um feels more like fan fiction than speculation. No, it doesn't. It feels like speculation because everything she's saying, she's drawing a, uh, a evidence for from the text, you know? Like, she's not doing a headcanon here. Everything that she's saying, she's backing up with an example. And every time she does that, she's like, it's probably nothing, but, but she is bringing enough example to back it up from the text. Solid examples too. And you know, it's almost certainly not true. And the reason it's almost certainly not true is because every single one of the questions that it raises can be answered by, it's bad writing, but 
Let's 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 see where this ends up. This is excellent speculation. This is brilliant. I've already told Discord and Kitty if she ever wants to write for this channel, I'll fucking hire her. I don't care. One of the problems with Zoval's repeated claims of playing 5D chess is people just haven't been buying it. He seems cartoonishly evil, like someone we're meant to dis mistrust on sight and go out of our way to stop. Nothing like a master strategist at all. I completely agree. That's only made worse when a character that clearly is supposed to be believable, uh, clearly supposed to be a believable strategist, is right there. But if I'm right, and the Primus is secretly the Jailer, then suddenly it all makes sense. To pull it all off, he would need to be brilliant. He would need to have the sort of strategic mind one can only get from watching the same battle play out over and over across all realities. And if part of his plan was specifically to make it seem like Zoval was independently responsible for everything, from the plans involving domination armor to the plan to reach Zerith Mortis, then the Primus would want to specifically frame Zoval as the big bad. So the thing I'm, I'm thinking right now, okay, and this is very unfair on Discordian Kitty because this is not what she's doing at all, but the thing that this reminds me of, and I think that comments uh, belly our video incoming, is this the plot twist that saves Shadowlands? That, I think that's what is, it, this is alluding to. Do you know what this feels like a little bit to me? It reminds me of the last season of Sherlock, which was so shit that fans of Sherlock came up with this theory that there was a secret fourth episode in the season. And like, they were convinced. And they were like, okay, I know this season's been shit, but we think there is a secret fourth episode, which will reveal it to all be a dream, <laughs> or like some shit like that, and make it make sense. They were ignoring the fact that Sherlock had been shit since episode two of like season two. That was their mistake. And they, they were pointing to like some of the most outrageous evidence, like, uh, you know, in some of the promos, they had like pictures of Steve Moffat, like doing promos, like with his fingers like that, you know, four because it was season four and they were like yeah but he's showing there's gonna be four episodes and uh, there was a line in one of the episodes where sherlock goes you know people always expect things in threes they always stop at three and they don't think beyond that and people read a lot into that line and uh the show that was replacing sherlock at the end of the season like the next week was a, a show called apple tree yard and they were like they thought it was a fake show they thought it was fake in the listings and that actually that was going to be an episode they thought they faked an entire fucking like adaptation of a novel to be showing in that week uh, so that they could have a secret episode of Sherlock because the, the, the thing that you would do obviously when you've got one of the most successful shows on TV and one of your most bankable assets is not tell people when it's on uh, I mean that is quite literally very much the definition of copium Sherlock is great what do you mean uh, I liked Sherlock a lot in the first season season one of Sherlock was good good fun and the first episode of season two of Sherlock was fine. And then the last scene in the se episode one of season two of Sherlock happened. I don't, I don't know if you remember the last scene of se season two, episode one. Um, but it's the one where Sherlock rescues his girlfriend from the Taliban. Not even by doing clever stuff, but by fighting the Taliban with a sword. Don't know if you remember that. His girlfriend's about to get killed by the Taliban, and the person that's about to behead her turns out to be Sherlock, and he's like, don't worry, it's me, Sherlock. And then maybe he's got a clever plan to get out of the Taliban house. And his plan is to fight all of the Taliban with the sword, which he does. And that's the end of the episode. So. Shadowlands is not over. Secret 9.3 patch incoming. This changes everything. According to the Primus, he began to notice Zoval's influence seeping outside of the moor and decided to investigate. He hid his sigil away in Corthia, left a trail of hidden messages detailing his plans and warning against Zoval, and then he headed to the moor where Zoval defeated him, stripped him of his memories, and imprisoned him as the rune carver. It seems strange, the master strategist of the Shadowlands being so easily outwitted and defeated by his own dominated pawn. When we meet the Rune Carver, he seems like quite the pathetic creature. Chained up in Torghast, he tells us how his memories have been stolen by Zoval, but if we help him by bringing him his memories and releasing one of his hands, he promises to help us by creating powerful equipment. We want very much to do this because it unlocks the Rune Carving system, so we enlist Venari's help. She does, but before she sends us 
us on our way, she takes a moment to warn us about our actions. No creature imprisoned in that place should be trusted. Tread carefully, mortal. Once again, I'm reminded of the BlizzCon announcement trailer. Savannah stops to stand in front of a kneeling and chained figure while the narrator tells us, within the realms of the shadow lies the darkest of terrors which should never be set free. The implication is that the chained figure is Zoval, who Sylvanas freed, but that's not quite right. Even though we have seen images of Zoval bound and chained in this way, if he overpowered the Primus eons, eons ago, he couldn't have been physically chained himself by the time Sylvanas arrived. The only creature still in that position by the time she arrived was the same bound and chained figure we came across in Torghast. By the time we come across the room carver, we are led to believe that he has been imprisoned for eons, that he's entirely helpless, we are led to believe this by the rune carver himself. This is the Primus's story, and it's a deception. In reality, the Primus was in control the entire time. Once again, it is said the only losses the Primus suffered were intentional. There is a reason to believe that. If we find the Primus seemingly suffering from a defeat, it is part of his own plan. What I'm hearing is Primus 5000 IQ chess. Yeah, absolutely. But the theme is constant. You can't trust anyone. Things aren't always what they seem. But just because the situation appears one way doesn't mean that's the way it is. We are told this over and over again and yet are fooled over and over again. When Venari warned us not to trust the Rune Carver, it was easy to dismiss at the time. We already knew the Rune Carver was going to be an ally to us, helping us to make our powerful legendaries. Venari's warning could quite safely be put down to a little bit of flavour, boding words to give a utility quest line a little bit of edge. Unless we really do take the overreaching theme of deception to heart. What if we look at the rune carver with the attitude that he might not be as helpless as he seems? If I am right, and the Primus has both been fully in control and the true jailer all this time, then his appearance as a Val's prisoner is, you have to admit, the perfect cover. No one is going to believe the prisoner of an obvious bad guy like Zoval is secretly both his master and the one fully in control of everything he says and does. I love the theory though. I think it's so great. I, 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 it's genuinely a thing of beauty. Um, it's not true, obviously, and there's one very, very obvious reason why it's not true. Unfortunately, because I think, it, uh, you know, it, it's a really interesting um, avenue to go down. But there's one incredibly obvious reason why it's not true, which maybe will be addressed in this incredibly good article. The reason it can't possibly be true is because they've run out of time to do it. It would have to be something that happened in this expansion. And it hasn't. And it ain't gonna fucking happen in 925. <laughs> That's what the secret 9.3 is for. Of course! Wait, wait, how many fingers does the Jailer have? He's got 9.3 fingers! Yeah, unless there's a secret patch for the secret raid, this ain't happening, it's as simple as that. It's not the kind of thing you can reveal later on, because like, yeah, it would be very handy to having us all, have us all wearing domination armor that then dominates us, right? But we're not gonna be wearing it next expansion. And that's, that's the thing, isn't it? Uh, if the next X-Pack is about dragons, they could tie into the infinite dragons being the Primus' ally, then come back to it later. Yeah, they could, they could, but I, I, I feel like for this to really work, in the way that Discordian is describing, it would need to happen here. Maybe I'm wrong, right? But that's how I feel about it. He had a way to keep an eye on everything going on in the moor. The Jailer's Eye. And here's an interesting tidbit. We eventually got rid of the Eye of the Jailer debuff in the 9.2 storyline, focusing on the Eye. In the very next week, we rescued the Primus from Torghast. It's so compelling. I, I just feel like I'm doing a, a secret episode of Sherlock right now. But this is obviously a great theory. This is obviously a really fucking good theory. Is there reason to believe the Primus is as ambitious and aggressive as I am claiming? The Primus rules Maldraxxus. The army of the Shadowlands, a zone with notable scourge-like aesthetic and birthplace of necromantic magic. Maldraxxus is known to value victory by any means possible. Every Eternal One shapes their realm around their own personality. With that in mind, I once again would like to highlight some of the qualities said to be inherent to Maldraxxus. In the Grimoire of the Shadowlands, we are given a list of each of the Maldraxian houses, their leader and their defining qualities. In many ways, Maldraxxus resembles our ideas about Orcish society, valuing strength and vi victory, strategy, intimidation, but there is also a heavy emphasis on more under hand avenues to power, subtlety and infiltration, exploiting weakness, poison, necromancy, and decay. One word we can't help noticing is missing from that list is the words... Honor. Fucking hell, Discordian Kitty going 
hard. Looming over Maldraxxus, this giant structure of a necromancer. It always struck me as a very odd choice. Why not the Primus himself? During a discussion about the Primus equals uh, Jailer theory with Pariah, she pointed out the following. The seat of the Primus, the statue itself, I believe and always have, is what the Primus looks like without his mask. The Primus, as the dear old Gandalf wizard, has broken teeth, just like that statue. The statue is a hooded figure, the sim uh, symbolizing deception, and a skeleton symbolizing death. The classic disguise is bushy eyebrows, Check. Glasses. Check. Preferably horn rimmed. Check. And ch uh, check and check. Literally. And big nose. Check. A moustache. Check. On steroids. Wait, 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 wait. They're correct. But are we basically saying that the Primus is literally wearing like these? This is, I mean, let's not fuck around. This is what we're saying. We're literally saying that the Primus looks like this, but one handy dandy disguise later, Primus looks like this. I believe it. Once the Primus is established there as Mortis was safe, he revealed the way to make the Arbiter's sigil. As it turned out, it was easy. The attendants of Oribos were able to forge one. The portal opens and the Primus makes a great show of telling us that he would not be going himself. The Eternal Ones are forbidden so i think it's very i think it's very correct to notice the fact the primus never in these places where shit is going down he's not in the fight in the battle with zoval at the end of sanctum of domination he's not like in the places where the fighting happens he doesn't go into uh the sepulchre of the first ones and yes it could very well be because this this theory is correct or it could be that his model is very limiting. There's, a, There could be a very good reason uh, why the Primus doesn't go to the Sepulchre of the First One raid and why he's not amongst the Planeteers uh, and Uther who get dominated by Zoval at the end. And it could be because of all of this, or it could be because his model is a pain in the fucking ass and there's no way you can make that model kneel down at the end of the Sepulchre raid like all the other ones. However, there's there's a really interesting thing here that I don't think is mentioned that I think backs up some of this. Who's the last person we see fighting Helia? We technically fight Helia in in uh, 9.1, but we don't. We uh, we fight Ryaz while the Primus fights Helia. It is true. He's the one that makes everything. He makes all the portals to the places we go. He tells us how everything works. He tells us what to do. He gives us flying. He makes the crown of wills. So what now? We do actually see the Primus in Zerath Mortis this week, but it's a projection of him. The official story is that he is still on Oribos, but that he is communicating telepathically to or, or, uh, offer us advice. Once again, I can't help but notice a theme. One of the Primus casting a shadow. In the expansion announcement, his shadow behind Sylvanus. As we first enter and explore the Shadowlands, the Primus is nowhere to be found, but we still hear about him, receive a message from him, and deliver that message to others. The Primus may not be present as himself in 9.0, but his presence still casts a shadow. By Chains of Domination, we encounter the visions of the Primus in Corthia that lead us to his sigil, as if he left a shadow of himself behind to guide or manipulate us. In Sepulchre of the First Ones, we watched as he cast his shadow over Zalval. Finally, we once again engaged not with the Primus himself but with an image a shadow and what is the subject the Primus is advising us on domination the Primus consistently frustrated with the weaknesses of domination has taken the opportunity to research it further enlisting our help not to destroy the weapon that is domination to but to work out the kinks and perfect it who else do we know that's done that who else do we know who has manipulated people to find the weaknesses in their own plan and to get the strongest answers to that plan. I'll tell you who. Arthas in Wrath of the Lich King. Then he takes the crown from us, telling us that he will hold on to it to keep it close until it is needed again, while we turn our efforts towards defeating Zoval. At the moment, we are, we believe, victorious. Zoval lies defeated. The rift between our world and the Shadowlands is closed. Azeroth's soul is safe. The Primus may or may not be evil, and he may or may not be positioned exactly where he wants to be. And he may or may not be positioned exactly where he wants to be, with a lot more knowledge about why domination sometimes fails. A crown whose power we do not fully understand yet, and possibly even free access to that universe-changing power everyone's been going on about. In Quest on the PTR, we see neither the Primus nor the Crown of Wills again, though we have seen Arbiter Pelagos wearing the crown in Datamind images. Yeah, we also know there's a cinematic uh, in... in there's, a, there's a rendered cinematic, which I think will be quite short, like literally just uh, Pelagos becoming the Arbiter next week. But it, I, it will be rendered. I don't think it'll be a cutscene. I think there's a rendered cinematic coming, and I think we'll see him put on the Crown of Wills there. 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that there's a rendered cinematic next week, but a very, very short one. Pretty insignificant, really. We know that patch 925 is coming and that patch 9.2's main story used to have an eighth and final chapter called Judgment. We know that conspiracy or no conspiracy, there are still some loose ends to tie up, especially regards to Tyrande and Sylvanas. Finally, right at the beginning of this article, I mentioned a line in the announcement trailer. Death comes and the end of everything is just the beginning. Oh, the end of everything is just the beginning. Oh. Uh. So what does this mean? Do I think we will get a reveal that the Primus was the real jailer all along? That every time Zoval says things like every event set in motion, every pawn set into play, it was actually the Primus speaking, boasting in plain sight about a plan that, you would have to admit, required godlike skills, manipulation, substitution, strategy? Yes. No. Honestly? No. <laughs> but it sure is fun to speculate. And my favourite thing about this theory is even if the Primus never reveals himself and we never learn it was all a big conspiracy, it is still always possible. If he hasn't revealed his true colours yet, it could simply be because he's playing the long game. And that, for me, is a headcanon I choose to believe for my own enjoyment, if nothing else. I will leave you one last thing. There is precedent in World of Warcraft to use Latin or Latin-sounding words to hide secret meanings. For example, the Mortis in Zereth Mortis means death. We were told Grimoire that Zereth itself translates to Keystone or Cornstone, giving us a name that translates to the Keystone, Cornstone of Death. As I was reminded when writing in the history of Anduin Rin, apart from the obvious dreadlords, World of Warcraft also has a precedent of deception and manipulation tied specifically to dragons. Anixia, the black dragon, and her own long game of deception and subterfuge was one of the first threats we ever faced. With both those things in mind, I will point out one possible interpretation for the word Maldraxus. Malum, Latin for evil. Draco, Latin for dragon. Maldraxus, loosely translated, means evil dragon i love it i love it i love it do you know the most compelling thing about this entire theory so i, I don't think it's true but i i, I can't be 100 percent. this is not true which is the sign of a great great theory do you know for me the most the, the most plausible and compelling piece of evidence in this entire theory steve denuse's fucking interview that i did not read about before i read this article where he says some fucking shit about the Primus that I had never read before, where he says the Primus has used his time to hone his tactical destruction and strategic thinking beyond mortal constraints, thanks to a little help. It was said that the Primus sought out an ally who could show him the infinite time ways. Like, that directly links the Primus to dragons. And it's in some bullshit interview. And it's not been mentioned in game at all, but it's clearly something that Stephen Newser has. Th that is the thing that I find incredibly compelling and interesting about this and the thing that for me makes me go huh it's very likely that this is like he says this and it's just something that they they had to scrap it's very likely this is something that just never made it into the game but like that's the most likely explanation and you know me fam i always love the most likely explanation it saves me a lot of work but though it's so intriguing to say the infinite time ways, when we, we all know there's a dragon expansion coming up next, quite possible that this was something they were going to put in the game that just never found its way into it. Because one thing's certain, it sure as fuck isn't in the game. And yet, yet, it's so fucking compelling. Like, this is like the most compelling piece of evidence in the entire thing for me. I love it. I love it as a theory. And so just like, this is the way that you theory craft, right? Now... I always held up Anne Stickney as the best WoW theory crafter. Not only because her theories were fucking legit, don't forget that Azeroth being a titan is an Anne Stickney theory. She came up with it on Blizzard Watch years before it happened in uh, Chronicle. To the extent where we don't actually know if it was her idea or not that they just then made a thing. Like, she saw that one coming so so far in advance that no one can really be sure and only Chris Metzen will ever really know if he had the idea before Anne Stickney did. So it's not just her brilliant theories that make her such an amazing theory crafter. It's the way she presents the theories and she doesn't give a shit if she's wrong. She presents them as just fun things which might be true. She backs them up with evidence. She doesn't make the evidence fit the theory. Do you know what I mean? Which is what bad theory crafters do. Like sometimes me and always some other people. And 
Discordian Kitty is following the uh, the the proper school of theory crafting here, where every claim she makes, she backs up with compelling evidence. She's not going to come back to this theory and bend a load of things to fit her theory. Oh, that wasn't even on Blizzard Watch. It was WoW Insider. Yeah, thank you. My first experience of Anne Stickney was on uh, Blizzard Watch. So yeah, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, it's definitely too late for this expansion. You're completely right, Bortales. And that's that's the reason I was dismissing it or thinking it wasn't true. However, connecting it to the dragons like this opens up the idea that it could go into the next expansion. I think this is a great theory. I really, really like it. I don't care if it's true or not. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's so compelling that it's fun just to talk about. And that's like the sign of a great bit of speculation. I think it's a tremendous bit of writing. She can come and work for Taliesin and Nevertel anytime she wants. It's fucking legit. I love it. I can't remember who made the comment now, but you're, you're right. It does self-reference itself a little bit uh, as it goes on, which is like bad and something uh, speculation shouldn't do because it's usually a sign that speculation can't hold up on its own if it has to self-reference -refer and use its, itself, use its own theory as evidence, which is something that fuck it let's just say it. something that's, that pyromancer speculation does a lot or used to do a lot is like use its use its own theories as evidence of a new thing being true you know and this almost does that but the thing is it's notable it doesn't even need to it actually works better if it doesn't do that so that's the only that's the only like fault i can find in it really and in the writing of it i think it's a great write-up she deserves all the praise she's going to get for this infinite dragonflight leads to army of light invading you watch how this works in two x packs yeah was playing through the crown of wills chapter again earlier today interesting that i noticed that feels weird after reading this after crafting the crown of wills the primus keeps the crown for himself yeah well that's the thing and i get it the primus is like the instigating force behind like everything we do he's like okay now we have to do this i'll make it possible go here and do this and you're like okay he's like okay i've made another thing possible go here and do this it's like okay now i'm gonna tell you how to like break domination magic we need to go here and do this and you're like oh, okay and he's like okay i've made this thing now go here and do this i'm not gonna do it you're gonna do it and that's kind of like the character they've given him like that's almost certainly a uh a mechanical thing like a game mechanic thing he serves the role as being the person who knows shit and tells us what to do and we do it and that can so easily be crafted into someone who's manipulating us right in the same way that everyone's just, like there was lots of memeage about Khadgar being bad in legion because he was the same character he's the one that knew everything he's the one that knew how to do everything told us to do everything he was the one that's like i'm gonna open a portal here blah same with uh same with magni in bfa had that same role right i think it's fascinating and i love it i can't wait to hear what other people have to say about this uh theory this has been an absolute joy to read it on stream and i love everything about it that like i wanted to kind of pick it apart a little bit and there's th there's like little things i can say about it to pick it apart and be this guy right but i just don't want to because i think it's such a glorious piece of work it's such a glorious piece of writing and i love it i buy it as well it would be like a tremendous it would be it would be so perfect and so good that even talking about it does make me feel a bit like secret episode of sherlock right my boy is at the door i have to go i love you all i'll see you later from me cheerio